Aloha and welcome to Hub Talks. Uh, my name is Shauna Trebena and I am here with George Yarborough. We're your co-hosts for this show and we're also directors at Proto Hub Honolulu, which you see behind me here. And I'll let George tell you a little bit about what Proto Hub is. We have an exciting show today. I'm actually um, very thankful that we have the guests that we are on today. But first, um, let's talk a little bit about Proto Hub. So this is our second show, and um, so we want to give the word out what Proto Hub is. It's a co-working space that provides the opportunity for entrepreneurs and startups to build their business. Mm -hmm. And freelancers to support them and find clients and students and anyone that would go to a coffee shop um, to do some work instead come to the Proto Hub. Easy parking. Free coffee. Organic coffee. Yep. Uh, blazing Wi-Fi. Lots of awesome people. Yep. And what's <laughs> cool is we have um, a newsletter that comes out and we talk about what's happening in the community at large and also specifically at Proto Hub. So um, I'm going to say a couple things. So um, tomorrow, Wednesday, mm -hmm. the first, or sorry, the second Wednesday of every month, we have Sexy Salad Wednesdays where we try to use a local, we try to highlight a local produce and or farm and then we provide a salad for the community. You can come in at seven dollars and you chit chat, uh, talk story. And then on Wednesday evening at the Manoa Innovation Center, who is a partner of ours, mm -hmm. uh, we have, this is a mouthful, WordPress Workshop Wednesdays. Got it. Did it. And uh, it's a four class series, let me read this, it's a four class series providing entrepreneurs, professionals, and hobbyists the skills and resources to develop attractive, functional, and sustainable websites. That was written by our one and only teacher, John LeBlanc. And it is at Manoa Innovation Center tomorrow. It's the second class of the series, but um, I've been through most of them, actually all of them. And you can start on the second class, it's no problem. So if you want to build an attractive, functional, and sustainable website, do that. Um, and then also, on at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Thursday, we have our guests here, but also a free screening of Earth, a New Wild, and Ocean. So we're going to be talking about the state of our oceans and um, how sexy Mother Ocean is. <clears throat> Can everyone read that? I idea. saw that. I saw this in the kitchen today, and I was really excited about, about uh, finding it. It's a treasure, mm -hmm. and it's just perfect for the show today. Mm -hmm. So. I'll leave it right here. Yeah, we're anyone, very excited. Anyone to wants to wear it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyone wants to wear it? Go ahead, grab it. Okay, so on our show today, we have uh, right now two guests. We have Miss Evelyn Weiss, Senior Communications Manager at the Nature Conservancy, and we also have Liberty Peralta, Director of Communications at PBS Hawaii. Welcome to the show. Thank at you. Hub Talks, our second Great show. To be yeah, yeah. Um, so, thank you once again, but. Um, Evelyn, I'm going to start with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what the Nature Conservancy does, especially here in Hawaii? Sure. Yeah. The Nature Conservancy is a global organization. We work in all 50 states and 35 countries. And our mission is to preserve the lands and waters that we all depend on to survive globally. In Hawaii, what that means is that we focus specifically on preserving and protecting what's left of our native forest. Mm -hmm. And sadly, we've lost already more than 50% of it and each island has its own unique situation there. Forests are important because of fresh water. And then the other thing that we do is protect and work with communities to figure out ways to most effectively bring back abundance to our nearshore coral reefs. Okay. I read about um, the connection between forest and water. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Because I don't think that's very you know, intuitive to everyone, but once I read about it, it just clicked in. Well, the Mako to Makai connection is well understood and entrenched in Hawaiian culture, but in more modern culture, perhaps it's not as, as well understood. Essentially, the idea is if you take care of the mountains, you're taking care of the oceans, mm -hmm. and to some extent, vice versa. Mm -hmm. And the reason that matters is because, for instance, when, when the mountains don't have native forest or any forest on them, when rain comes crashing down, it basically makes mud and dirt go into the ocean and smothers coral reefs. Mm -hmm. So that's just one of many examples. Mm -hmm. What's the name of that? Is, this, is that the Apua'a system, or is that just kind of like... Um... An Apua'a is a land division that was used in ancient Hawaii that's about more about community and governance and land management, mm -hmm. not specifically the Mako to Makai connection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, sorry, did you want to... I just wanted to ask one more thing about the coral reefs as well, yes. when we talk about yeah. that whole connection, that okay. I think, what is it, 80% of the U.S.'s coral reefs are here in Hawaii? Yes, that's right. Yeah. What? Yes. 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 I know that. Yeah. And tell us why that's so important for our local life here. 
Well, coral reefs in general are very important to any island, but for here, us here in Hawaii, we were talking earlier, they provide a buffer to coastlines. So anytime that you have a giant storm coming in, if you didn't have coral reefs, then the waves would really impact and erode our shorelines even more than they already do. Mm -hmm. Also, coral reefs are the reason that we have the great waves that we do have that people love to surf yeah. here in Hawaii. Which is a huge tourist attraction. And mm -hmm. it, is, you know. it stretches yeah. every day life. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, it does, uh -huh. salt water does heal on many <laughs> levels. Um, we all know that. And the most important, perhaps, is that it's food. It provides food for many people. And historically, it was considered the place that we went to get our food. Mm -hmm. I mean, we grew stuff on land, of course, too. But, mm -hmm. you know, harvesting fish and other marine life from the ocean. Mm -hmm. And that has been dramatic. All of those things have been dramatically impacted mm -hmm. by us humans over the last several hundred years. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> how did you get involved? You left us with a hook before the show, because I was going to ask you, how did you get involved? And you're like, I got a cute story. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm going to wait to the, sto to the show, uh, show, so go ahead. And well, you're wondering, how did I get involved in sort of environmental work? Yes. And so, Which I, I'm imagining leads you to, the, to where eventually, you are now. Yeah, which is how I ended up at the Nature Conservancy. So when, I, a story. Yeah. when I was a little kid, um, I moved all the time. But at one point, we were living on the East Coast, and I was going to a school there. and. In the elementary school that I was in, they brought out these little booklets, which were, I guess, designed to, it was to teach kids about the environment. And they were about two families, and the bad family was called the Gluts. And the I don't gluts. remember the name of the good family, but I knew I wanted to be like the good family. <laughs> <laughs> and the bad family did things like wasted water and left their lights on and turned their heat way up and their air conditioning way down and basically wasted and glutted out on mm -hmm. energy and, and the Earth's natural resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was very little. I, I'm not sure if I even remember what grade it was, maybe fourth grade or something. And I became very passionate about the environment all mm -hmm. the way back then. Wow. And then as I grew up and became an adult, I just have worked in a variety of different jobs and careers that have had to do with the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. My, got that really early. My, my mom had a Montessori school in my house. So oh, when wow. I was growing up, there's 30 children and all the, the kids' books. And there was the Lorax. Yes. And there was oh, that yeah. like, villain, the Wensler. Yes. That you, know, <laughs> that you literally made something, yeah. you made needs, which mm -hmm. I translated into things that people think they need. And yes, you would use it exactly. once and throw it away. Exactly. And then all the forest went away. So. Same idea. Same idea. I understand this. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how much that influenced me. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, these thanks, kids' Mom. books. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so how long have you been at the Nature Conservancy? I've been here at the Nature Conservancy in Hawaii since late 2007. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I'm super lucky and excited to be working for Hawaii's natural resources. Right. Mm -hmm. We can't really live here without our natural resources. So humans in nature, we have to work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what this yeah. PBS series is all about. Great, thanks for the segue. Perfect, look at that. Plug Speaking of in. which, what do you yes. think? <laughs> Someone's a senior communications manager. Okay, Liberty. Hi. Um, can you give us a backstory on the documentary? Like, how did it um, come to fruition? Or, you know, how long has it been developed? Or? Sure. So, actually, we were talking about this earlier, and it's it's actually been five years in the making. PBS partnered with the Nature Conservancy on making this documentary about, you know, a lot of other nature documentaries that we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice to look at nature, but we don't really see the human component. It's always okay. like, oh, look how beautiful it, which, which is fine, which yeah. is great. But inspiring, the, right? Exactly. Yeah. But um, the the sort of spin with that this documentary takes, and it's actually a five part documentary, is it looks at the human component. How does humankind interact with this beautiful world that we live in? Okay. So, um, two episodes actually premiered last week. There's one premiering tomorrow about our forests, and the one that premieres next week on our air is on oceans, and so this um, screening that we're doing at ProtoHub is an advanced screening of that oceans oh, okay. episode. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're pretty excited to have it there at ProtoHub. Yeah. Um, why did you pick the ProtoHub by the chance? What kind of brought you there? We knew about it. And yeah, it I mean, it, just, it seemed like a cool um, place. I, I've heard of other people, uh, a couple of friends who have been there. Um, a couple of them are members, so it just it seemed like a place that made sense for us to, mm -hmm. to hold cool. it there. Yeah, we've had a few documentaries, and um, we had a big wall that we used to kind of uh, portray the, the films, and I think it's caught on. Yeah. More, and more, more and more people are bringing their, their like screenings to the hub, so we're pretty nice. excited. Yeah. We, yeah. Always, we always have a full house. Yeah, popcorn, yeah. pillows, and all that stuff. So Excellent. Yeah, and it's going to be, we should mention this Thursday um, at 6 p.m. as arrival. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, okay, so you said that it kind of sets it apart with the human component. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to the website, which is a beautiful website, um, through, what's the website, yeah, the what's actual it? address? Um, the nature.org slash new wild. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's this word, hope, that is just like mm -hmm. pushed out there. And that's, I'm assuming, is kind of like bringing in this human component it's to the it. theme to the, the, theme of it, to the yeah which is refreshing right mm -hmm. rather than devastation doom and gloom, and doom <laughs> yeah. and gloom like, yeah. look at what oh, humans did yeah <laughs> well some people some people react better to like a positive you know a positive theme or positive <laughs> reinforcement rather than like oh you should do this because there will be no tomorrow right mm -hmm. exactly yeah. mm -hmm. it's more of a proactive approach too because because it does feature people who are actually doing something about okay. what's happening mm -hmm. here in hawaii too or all in like international it's it's international so the first segment we see people in palmyra okay. people and flora and fauna and, and people in palmyra at all and and the nature conservancy does a lot of work there mm -hmm. um we also get a chance to look at new york harbor which is not you know new york's probably the last place that you would think of when, when you think of nature. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, but there's yeah. actually some interesting um, work that's being done in New York too. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a pure, I think it's Pier 9. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually trying to start an initiative where um, the, the rotted out harbor is sort of like a, a, a human made sort of coral reef to bring mm -hmm. back really? mm -hmm. things like oysters, which were Oysters from the New York Harbor. Right. Well, yeah, I know. It sounds gross, <laughs> yeah, but apparently yeah. oysters... Not to eat, to okay. filter. Not to, okay. not to, eat, yeah. okay. to filter the water, because the water is so dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Not everything in the ocean. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe eventually. Yeah. Yeah. If it ever gets you know. clean enough. Right. right. True. Well, that's right. interesting, because New York did the High Line, where they took the old uh, elevated right. train track and made it into mm -hmm. a human walkway that was bringing back nature into the city. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if we think about exploring the interaction of humans and nature, New York's a really good place to look at. Right. And it's, it's like a big intersection happening. A lot of people. <laughs> exactly. And, and it's sort of the perfect place where it kind of demonstrates, well, nature and humans don't have to be these silos. Right. You know, they can, they can coexist. Yeah. Well, we have to coexist. <laughs> right. We yeah. do coexist. And what I love about this PBS series is that it helps to clarify that. Mm -hmm. So much of what we hear about as it relates to the environment is that it's in terrible shape, it's awful, mm -hmm. yeah. the sky is falling, and it is if you look at it from an ecological perspective. But the reality mm -hmm. is we're part of nature, humans mm -hmm. are part of nature, and our right. impact on nature is something that's unavoidable, mm -hmm. and there are things that we can all do about it. Mm -hmm. And we're really excited at the Conservancy to be included in this series. I mean, you asked what was different about it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's different about it from us, from our point of view, is that it includes a lot of our projects around the globe. Mm -hmm. So that's, of course, exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and what we try to do is, is exactly that, figure out ways that we can coexist and thrive. Sure. Because we're here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going anywhere. Humans are, unless, you know, the planet explodes, we're going to be here. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we have um, the Nature Conservancy and PBS partnering mm -hmm. on showing the screening here yeah. in Hawaii. It's going to be at the Proto Hub this Thursday, mm -hmm. um, beginning at 6 p.m. And then it's a one-hour documentary. Yeah. And then Correct. afterwards, there's going to be a panel. Yeah. Um, who's going to be on the panel? Or what topics are going to be yeah. discussed? Well, one of the things that we wanted to do was give people a chance to learn about what this documentary means for Hawaii, because mm -hmm. Hawaii specifically is not featured in, in the ocean's piece. Mm -hmm. the, the property that we manage, Palmyra Atoll, of course, is featured, and it's an amazing place mm -hmm. where sharks dominate, which is what a healthy coral reef system looks like, mm -hmm. among other things. Can um, you explain where exactly where the Palmyra Atoll is? It's about a thousand miles south of here, mm -hmm. in the middle of the ocean. It's a little atoll, which is a, the last bit of what's left of a volcano and just some land. So um, we're going to have Scientists who do research all across the Pacific, Alan Friedlander from UH, Eric Conklin, who's our director of marine science at the Nature Conservancy, uh, David Sellers, who's our director of the Palmyra program, um, and Susan White, who's a director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, superintendent of all the monuments. Wow, so it's a panel and a discussion? Well, the idea is really more of a discussion. Okay. It's not really, I don't want them to just sit up there and talk. The Even idea better. is people have just seen this amazing sure. show. They're going to say, what does this have to do with Hawaii? Mm -hmm. And Hopefully we'll be able to tell them that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, very cool. Thank you so much. So we're going to continue this conversation right after our break. We're talking about the screening of oceans at the Proto Hub this Thursday at 6 p.m. Um, we look forward to seeing you right after this break. Thanks. Aloha. My name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ. And my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com, 
We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the islands. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in, in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which, please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed healthcare consumers. Aloha and welcome back to Hub Talks. We have some really special guests here from the Nature Conservancy today. Uh, my name is Shauna Truvena. This is our co-host George Yarbrough. Uh, we've been speaking with Evelyn White, who's the Senior Communications Manager for the Nature Conservancy. And with us is a new special guest. We're very excited to have you on. Sam Gon is a Senior Scientist and Culture Advisor for the Nature Conservancy. And we've also read through your amazing bio. We have this deep and rich history as an ecologist and zoologist. And I have to admit that when George and I saw you did your PhD specializing in animal, beha animal behavior, we kind of stopped and got quiet and we're like, I wanted to do that when yes. I was younger. Very jealous. Me too. I was like, <laughs> I actually saw the dolphins and whales when I was a kid, and I thought I was going to be an oceanographer and work with the animals. And so we both had this moment of just real, like, <laughs> loving the career path and the life that you've been leading. So yeah. we would really just love to throw the floor to you right now as this person who has had just many, many years on this trajectory of understanding the ecology um, of Hawaii. And if you, if you could just give us a little journey of how you first got really connected in a relationship with the ocean, which I'm sure goes back quite a ways, and then just how you got into the Nature Conservancy and sort of what your career track has been, mm. um, and share some of your knowledge. We'd so appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks a lot, and, and thanks for having me on. Yeah. Um, gosh, I guess I grew up, I was that little kid that after school would be down in the streams, turning over rocks, looking at, <laughs> looking at things that are living in there, and yeah. instead of like going home and watching TV <clears> or whatever. Where it was, or even when I was at home, I'd be walking around in the in the yard, looking at what kinds of insects were visiting the, the plants. When I got my PhD in animal behavior, it was the behavioral ecology of the Hawaiian happy face spider um, on several different islands. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of like an iconic little spider, bright yellow with a smiling face on the back. Once you show it as your first slide, it doesn't really matter what you say about it. People will say, that was a great talk. Because it's such a charis charismatic little microfauna yeah. element of Hawaii. So, um, charismatic that, microfauna might be my favorite sound bite on the show so far. <laughs> well, Wait, we're just started. Yeah, we're just started. <laughs> and so, you know, I... I was born in this valley that uh, in Nukuwanu here, uh, that nestles downtown Honolulu. Uh, born there, raised there, right next to Liliha Bakery, um, and uh, and then still live perched on the edge of Nukuwanu and, and look down on it. So, you know, having lived here all my life as a kama aina, as a child of this of this land, um, uh, I think, and especially growing up at a time shortly, you know, even before statehood, I was born before statehood, which is kind of frightening. Um, <laughs> But uh, growing up in that times, right, when things were developing, when you saw the world changing rapidly, um, I think that kind of instilled that first idea of, of where are we headed? 
and are we heading in, in the right place? Mm -hmm. So, um, but it was when I started exploring, uh, exploring the cultural roots here in Hawaii, which are extremely deep. You know, any time that you have a place as rich as Hawaii with so many different biomes, everything but tundra, and you can get desert and tropical rainforests and bogs and beautiful rivers, amazing marine ecosystems. And once you start exploring all of that, and you start exploring the long history of relationships between people and place mm -hmm. in Hawaii, that's mm -hmm. when you start to fully realize how integrated people should be mm -hmm. in the ecosystems here. Um, how we've had a thousand years of people living here and it wasn't only until the last 200 or so years that we started going way out of balance. Mm. And I did a recent uh, study that, that demonstrated very clearly from archaeology, from agricultural modeling, from all kinds of other things, and from the rich body of, uh, of Hawaiian language sources, the chants, the stories of ancient Hawaii, that describes the places where people were, where they worked, where they lived, all the, all the adventures and the mythological legends, um, they all have names. And you can find each of those places in the islands. And when you match that with the archaeology and what we knew about the ecological footprint of ancient Hawaii, we know that hundreds of thousands of people lived here on just 15% of the land area. Yeah. Now that's reverse. 85% of the land has been converted from what it originally was. And we only, you know, our self-sufficiency is down to 15%. And 85% um, or more comes from Costco or whatever. You right. know? And so we've lost that self-sufficiency and we've also greatly increased the impact on, on the land. So what have we lost, right? Mm -hmm. We've lost that relationship between people and the land. We're kind of mm -hmm. disconnected from, from the place. So. Part of our whole mission is to re realize once again for everybody how tightly dependent we are mm -hmm. to the place that we live, how beautiful it is, how much, we, uh, how much we stand to gain and lose from our relationship here. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, the term ancient knowledge systems in your TED talk um, in Maui a few years back. And, um, does that have a role in, in what you just described and kind of bringing that back to now? Yeah, I think so. I think very much so. Um, if you're going to have a model for how we should behave in our environment, then why not use a model that was developed in this place? We talked a little bit earlier about the Ahupua'a. Mm -hmm. And uh, aside from being a system of land um, division that included the tops of the mountains all the way down to the coast and then onward into the sea, it was also the human role within that whole system. And so it really was a biocultural and, and socio-political convergence yeah. where people realized what resources they had, what the relationships were between the mountain, the freshwater systems, and the ocean, sure. and what their place was in it. And it, was a, it came out of a sense of reverence for that which provided such huge richness and such a wonderful lifestyle. Um, and so once you, once you recognize that, as long as you maintain that relationship, there's nothing you can do uh, without, uh, without concern for what the consequences are going to be. There's so many stories about when people go out of balance and they always end badly, <laughs> you know, in, in, in Hawaiian stories. Yeah. Um, and so they're meant to be lessons and there were lessons that were recognized even a thousand years ago. Right. Um, I think it's pretty amazing that you have like that connection between the technical aspect of your job um, and also well balance. You know, talking about balance, you're, you, know, you have this this um, other aspect as a cultural advisor, where you're able to kind of melt those two together. Mm. Um, I think it's pretty perfect for what you're envisioning and what you're trying to do. My my wife uh, is a hula dancer, and um, when she was undergoing her uniki, which is a rite of passage, where you go from being a student of dance to an actual dancer. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of cultural uh, uh, requirements for that. It was a year-long process. She needed to make all kinds of dyes and fiber cordage and her wow. instruments and the like. And because I had spent so much of my time in Hawaiian ecosystems, I knew which plants provided red dyes, brown dyes, yellow. And so I started taking her and her cohort of, of graduating students um, on hikes every week weekend. We would go up into the mountains, what do you need this week? And, and, and among them were chanters, and they said, oh, you should come in and sit in on Kumu Lake, Kumu John Lake, renowned master of, of Hawaiian chant and protocols, um, and another living treasure in the time that he was alive. Uh, and, 
And so I said, okay, why not? I'll sit in on one of these, on one of these classes. And when I did, they were in the middle of an extremely sophisticated um, chant, and I, I knew that this was not just some superficial exploration of, of Hawaiian culture. This was an opportunity to dive deeply into the roots of, of Hawaiian traditions. Um, I had taken Hawaiian language at the University of Hawaii, but unless you use it, it yeah. gets rusty, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and Kumu Lake would teach his classes in, in Hawaiian. Completely in Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in the course of a dozen years, sitting with him, building a repertoire of chants, going with him and, and taking part in things like inaugurations of governors or you know, wow. blessings of you know, the new Apple store in Kahala or you know, things like that, yeah. uh, you, you learn that Hawaiian culture and protocol has a role to play, not only in ancient times, but all the way up until today. And so knowing that there's, there are strong cultural links that exist today in our everyday life, those, uh, that element of everyday life extended into the natural world in ancient times and still can today. So, and so when I underwent my uniki as a, as a um, chanter, as a kahuna ka kanaleo, as soon as that happened, the Nature Conservancy is such an attentive organization to uh, the skills uh, that each of their employees has. They said, well, now that you have this kind of skill, we need to weave that into your role here in the Conservancy and in conservation. So part of the, part of the uh, mission then is that melding of that integration of Hawaiian cultural values and, and knowledge into our conservation work today. Cool. Can I actually ask about that in specific to the ocean in terms of sharing some knowledge that is really relevant to what's happening today? We have statistics like um, rainfall has decreased by 12% in Hawaii over the last 20 years. Sea level is rising um, 0.12 inches every year. Uh, the sea surface temperature is rising by 22 degrees Fahrenheit. When you hear these scientific statistics, what, what is your response to that? What do we need to understand about these numbers? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to understand that global process is always a huge thing. It took generations for us to get to where we are. It's going to take generations for us to reverse those kinds of things. And in the meantime, we need to be cognizant of what we need to do to adapt to the changing conditions, understand them more fully, and then counteract them. Mm -hmm. So um, that's something that's going to take 100 years to do, probably. Yeah. We only have 15 more minutes with you, so yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and so, and yeah. so it's up to all of us to recognize what our lifestyles uh, play in all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we put in you know, solar panels on our thing, we're, and uh, we, we try to minimize our water use. We're very cognizant of, of how our lifestyle impacts things, and we mm -hmm. try to minimize those kinds of things. When I found out, for example, that Cows are responsible for 25% of global warming gases. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, even though I love my steaks and hamburgers, I'm going to start minimizing the amount of beef that I eat in my, in my everyday diet. Mm -hmm. So it's those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. When you multiply what an individual does by the billions of people that we have on the planet, there's bound to be an effect. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just conscious decisions of what we make in our everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, so. Uh, as far as Hawaii is concerned, what sort of megaphones, this analogy, uh, are there that are calling to um, conservation? Like um, the Hokulea, as an example, would that be considered one of them? Oh, I absolutely think so. Um, I've been invited to, to uh, sail on one of the legs of the worldwide voyage. Which one? Uh, it'll be coming up in March, March 10th through the 27th. Really? It'll be in Aotearoa, which is New Zealand. Um, there's, a, there's a teaching uh, convention there. And so I'll be on board with educators from private schools, public schools, charter schools that are all training to be crew on, on the Hopulea. Um, and I have a connection with, with friends in, in Aotearoa, Maori friends, who have just been uh, seeded the management responsibilities for the largest national park in New Zealand. Wow. So they never signed the Treaty of Waitangi, and so they're very independent from the, from the national government. Wow. And the government has recognized that and said, okay, this is your place, this large interior national wow. park, and you now are primarily responsible. We'll still provide with you know, funding and with, and with advice, but we want you to be the managers of this place. So it's up to me to make sure that the crew of Hokulea connects with these folks so that they can see people of place responsible for the health of their place. That's the model for the world. Uh. That's, 
Beautiful place. We, we are sitting here with um, Sam Gon and Evelyn White from the Nature Conservancy. We're talking about our relationship with the ocean, which what could be more important here in Hawaii. And we're just going to take a quick break right now, but we're going to come back and talk more with Sam and Evelyn about the Nature Conservancy, the screening of, of the ocean movie, Earth, A New Wild, this Thursday at the Proto Hub at 6 p.m. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Andrew Howard. I'm an astronomer at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii up in Manoa. I'd like to tell you about the annual open house that we're having. This year it is on April 6th, 11 to uh, 4 p.m. It's an all-ages event, kids, grown-ups, even uh, people in between, everyone is welcome. We have a lot of uh, really fun activities. You get to meet astronomers, look at yourself in an infrared camera, play with Legos, make robots, look at videos, um, you can even make it, some of the kids like to make comets out of uh, gravel and, and, uh, and snow. Even adults like to do that too. You'll be able to look at the sun with a solar camera uh, safely. It's really a great activity. We do this every year um, in April and I hope uh, to see you this year. Thanks. Aloha and welcome back to Hub Talks. Um, I'm Shana and this is George. We're the co-hosts and the directors of the Proto Hub and we feature programs and events and important things that are happening here in Hawaii and especially the Proto Hub. This Thursday, February 12th from 6 to 8 p.m. we have a documentary, um, uh, Ocean, A New Wild, this um, Thursday and we have an hour documentary at 6 and then we have an hour discussion with some experts. Uh, to talk about ocean health and our relationship with the ocean here in Hawaii. We're here with Evelyn White and Sam Gon from the Nature Conservancy, and we're going to continue our conversation about the importance of community action here in Hawaii. So Evelyn, do you want to share some things that are happening here locally? Sure. Great. Um, at the Nature Conservancy, we're, we work with partners all across the state, and especially with local communities who really want to do something to improve the health of their resources, marine resources. They've seen the decline themselves. Mm -hmm and they're looking for help. And what we can provide is both science, sort of the data and the process for understanding what's actually going on, and then also navigating kind of the policy area of, you know, what do you want, if you want to do something that relates to the state, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. So we're really excited about that. And there's, a, there's over two dozen communities that have been working on this, in some cases for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we've been working with about a dozen of them, and our partners and other organizations like KUA have been working with many others, too. Mm -hmm. And at least from our point of view, it seems like that's kind of the wave of the future, mm -hmm. is you know, people in place, as Sam was saying, who love and are of, of a place, taking mm -hmm. care of that place. Right. Right. W and within the modern structure that we currently live in. And what are some of the examples of things they're doing, and what's the results? Well, right now, it's community-based subsistence fishing areas designation is something that a number of communities are going for. Ha'ena and Kauai is the first. Mm -hmm. and we're what does that mean? That means it's, a, it's an official legal designation through the state mm -hmm. that they are able to care for their place. Okay. So there's a number of ways to, to change what's happening in the ocean. There's very few rules in Hawaii about ocean use. Huh. Um, so a community who sees a decline and decides that they want to do something about it um, can get help from us or another organization to understand the science behind it and then come up with a step. So CBSFA designation uh, sort of officially gives them that power to, or authority to, you know, do something in their space. There's also communities that are looking at sort of a voluntary process where they've seen a decline, they know that there's an issue, so they're asking people who live there to just voluntarily rest an area. Mm -hmm. There's other communities that are looking specifically to go through a rulemaking process with the state. Mm -hmm. So each one is different and each one is different because of the community itself and what's happening in the mm -hmm. waters right there. It's so interesting because there's rights and then there's exercising those rights. Responsibility. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Clearly so I mean, basically what these communities are doing is exercising their responsibility to care for the resource, mm -hmm. not just the responsibility or the right to take from a resource. Mm -hmm. And I see that as something like um, doing beach cleanups, measuring the acidification. I, I don't know what else would happen. I'm curious what the actual measures they take are. Well, you know, the, the cultural approach to these kinds of things, um, when you look at Hawaiian knowledge, it's typically based in, in terms of, of olelo no eo. You'll have a saying that correlates a particular phenomenon of the season to the, to the maturation of, of octopus or to the breeding season of, of sharks mm -hmm. or the like. When the when really flowers are blooming, the sharks are biting because they're aggressive because it's mating season for them. Um, those kinds of observations were made long ago. 
um, and they continue to be made. That's the neat thing. Um, there are communities that focus on those kinds of things, on applying Hawaiian um, knowledge systems to today, mm -hmm. so that even as global warming or global climate change adjusts and, and, and changes the relationships, mm -hmm. um, they make note of those relationships and changes the, the set of sayings that occur for today that guide when people can fish uh, or, or the like um, also change. Mm -hmm. And so for each place, they remain on top of what their resources are doing, the natural cycles of things, even as the land, say, dries and the river doesn't flow as, as frequently to the sea. Mm -hmm. When it does flow, what are the phenomena that occur there? You know, those are the kinds of things that, that happen. When, and when a community is armed with that kind of local knowledge that no one else can bring to the table, then they're in the best position to make very specific rules about how their resources can be used. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to the policies of the state to fall in line with that and to, and to reflect the wisdom of place and people um, to the betterment of everybody. Wow, so that's community-driven, bottom-up change. Mm -hmm. So exactly. working with the top-down policymakers, et cetera, so it's really that. I, I always love top-down, bottom-up meeting together to, to mm -hmm. work on something. Do you need to live in that community to work in that community? I know people that have, and I have deep connections with places that I don't actually live. I'm not, would I be considered that part of com that community? I or? think modern communities these days are a much more diffuse kind of thing. Sure. And that anyone that spends the time in that place, that knows about that place, that works with the people of place, mm -hmm. that would be, place. all of those would be involved. Beautiful. We actually have an art show at the Proto Hub right now. I don't know if I'd be able to see this or not. It's very tiny, but it's people plus um, space equals place, and there's um, pictures from local, there's a whole local section, there's an individual section and a global section. Um, so anytime, be Monday to Friday, 9 to 5, or what Monday or Wednesday night, you can come by the Proto Hub and um, check out this incredible installation. It covers all of our walls. It's photography with local photographers. Um, one of the photographers is from Surfrider Foundation, Roth, and one of the photographers is George as well. So um, that whole sense of place is so important here in Hawaii. And it yes, has it is. so many personal and local implications um, that I'm glad we're speaking about it so much. Uh, I, I live on the south shore of Oahu, and they have one year where they can fish and one year where they can't fish. Do you have any comment on that? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, Does that come that from local year, culture or science? I think the one year that people are not allowed to fish demonstrates what kind of recovery can occur. Yes. Whether or not one year on and one year off is sufficient to actually maintain a sustainable system, that is the kind of thing that needs to be explored further. Yeah. Interesting. And, and there is some data that shows that that kind of thing, while it's true that in that period of time when the area is resting, the fish get bigger and there's more of them and you can go catch mm -hmm. them, um, over the many years, the actual sizes of the fish have shrunk. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's this, there's a thing we say, uh, big, fat, fecund females <laughs> are <laughs> kinds of fish that we want to leave in the ocean. Ah. And um, so one of the things people can do if you're a fisherman, you know, if you catch a really big fish, consider putting it back because that's the future of the coral reefs. That's the, that's where all the babies are going to come from. Interesting, because you talk about that relationship with place. I've lived in the same location for seven, eight years now, and I am in the water almost every day and snorkel and get to see the fish a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I notice that, you know, at the end of that year when they haven't been fishing, the snorkeling is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You have, like, the tang all around you. It just yeah. feels like you're, like, flying with the angels. And then, like, the next day you see the spears, and then a month or two later there's no more fish and yeah. then yeah so I've always wondered is this good is this not good and I, I believe in the fishing and I love eating fish so mm -hmm. it's not but I'm just wondering about that relationship and the I think they've demonstrated that if there are places that are more or less permanently protected, mm -hmm. those are the pl places where the abundance grows so much that it spills over into adjacent mm -hmm. areas where you can take fish. Yes. You know, and so if you have those foundational mm -hmm. uh, blocks of areas mm -hmm. that are that are important as fishery replenishments, mm -hmm. um, then that's the that's one of the strategies that can work. And maybe you can share with me too, because I was talking story with Ramsey Tom. I don't know if you know him. Mm -hmm. he, he was telling me about the um, traditional fisheries, and I believe he was saying something like the fish could swim in and out as long as they were a certain size, and then they were when they grew to a certain size, they could be harvested. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's the local uh, the fish pond system, mm -hmm. and so um, each of those fish ponds has a gate because you need to have flow of, of water mm -hmm. in and out to keep the system fresh. 
Um, but the, the gates have certain sizes between their slats, and so mm. a fingerlings and small fish that need protection from predators out there can find refuge within the, within the fish pond system. But mm -hmm. once they grow to a certain size, they can no longer leave. Right. They get nice and fat inside of the fish pond, and, and they provide for some of the protein sources um, uh, uh, for the people of that place. Yeah. It takes a lot to maintain a, a local mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine, and so that kind of system requires an investment. Are there, <clears throat> are there current any uh, fish ponds here that are working? Oh yes, uh, at Pai Pai Ohe Eia uh, in Kane Ohe along the, along the bay is one of those areas where uh, a large body of volunteers goes there regularly and they're, and they're working to, to uh, undo the damage of the last hundred years of neglect of that particular fish pond system to rebuild the integrity of the walls, reestablish the quality of the waters in there so that they can reestablish that, that fish pond yeah. system. And related to that, right above that fish pond is a, an area that's called Kaka Oivi. It's a partnership that we have with a local nonprofit that's looking to restore Lo'i, which is uh, Kanehoe was, was once an incredibly prolific area of producing food for mm -hmm. Oahu. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is going in there well, what they're doing, I should say, is going in there and with volunteers and with some help, removing invasive species, rebuilding Lo'i, basically providing food in a place that, you know, used to be a breadbasket. But it also state. provides an important um, sedimentation yes. and erosion control as mm. a stream that feeds those Lo'i. Um, whenever there's a flood event, the nutrients and the, and the silt uh, adds to the soil of the Lo'i instead of spilling into Kano exactly. Ohebe and smothering coral. Yeah. Ah, yeah. so if you were to paint a picture of what the, I have studied future studies at the University of Hawaii here, and we always talk about future scenarios that are either, you know, preferred is always what you're going towards, and there's a big emphasis on we can create our future, we can design it. If you could design your preferred future of the oceans, what would that look like? What components would all feed into that? I know we only have a few more minutes, so it could be a five-hour conversation. I think it would a be a, a, journey, a combination of really well-managed uh, well lands, so that the, the land and water system that feeds the ocean um, is intact. Um, you would have to have the, some areas that were set aside as, as permanent areas of protection of the marine systems, probably representative of the full range of ecosystems there, so that they can spill over and, and provide, provide all the resources that mm -hmm. human beings need. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have to really plan that kind of thing out. And it's not impossible. The land um, zone, zoning system for o Hawaii is actually remarkably progressive. Mm -hmm. And the same kind of thing could occur in the marine. That's the hope part. That right. Back, to your, yeah, right. back to your website. Can you share your website again with us? Sure. It's yeah. nature.org mm -hmm. slash new wild. Mm -hmm. And we really encourage people to visit that site and share your own stories of hope for humans and nature living and working together. I saw um, there was an interactive piece where they asked people to submit that. Yeah. And what is the new wild? Why is it called that? Well, it's in connection with this PBS series, mm -hmm. Earth, A New Wild, mm -hmm. the five-part series that features some of our sites and also places around the world that are places of hope, places where people are figuring out how we can more effectively interact with and survive and thrive with nature. Mm -hmm. What are the five series? I'm not putting you on the spot here, but you know what Home, are? which is sort of a global earth thing. Uh, yeah. There was one on planes. Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure if I know what the one is this week. Uh, this week is forests. 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 Oh yeah, forests is this week. Forests. Next week is oceans. oceans and then the last one's on, on water. And the last one is on fresh water. So. Uh -huh. So yeah. we're seeing the screening at the Proto Hub before it actually shows yes. on television. Yes. Okay. Sneak preview. Yeah. Sneak preview. <laughs> yeah. so again, we're talking with Evelyn and Sam here with the Nature Conservancy, and they, in partnership with PBS, are showing one of their five-part series on the New Wild, Earth, the New Wild, and this particular episode is on oceans, which can be more important to Hawaii and exciting to us. Um, we are going to just continue for a couple more minutes with them about the vision of what Hawaii could look like if we were doing the absolute best things we could do for the future health of our oceans, um, because we get so much help from the oceans. So mm -hmm. is there some other things you want to leave us with in terms of what we can do or inspiring projects or yeah. something? How to get involved, a call yeah. to action perhaps yeah. to your yeah. audience? Well, I want to also mention one thing that is true for Hawaii that is relevant to the ocean series, which features our property down in Palmyra Atoll. So Palmyra Atoll is a very healthy and robust ecosystem. Mm -hmm. There's lots and lots and lots of fish, really incredible healthy coral, basically lots of everything. Have you been there? Except humans. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's the baseline for what Hawaii used to look right. like. Oh, really? And so people just can't grasp that. You know, they look at what we've got 
uh, today, and they might compare it to a couple of generations back. When you go to Palmyra, you're hurled 500 years back. Really? And then you recognize, in, if Palmyra can be that way, what does it take in Hawaii to be that way as well? We know that up in Papahanaumokuakea, the northwestern Hawaiian Islands, we have something that comes closer to Palmyra. So it is possible here in Hawaii. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's up to all of us to know more about what's going on here so that we can find that balance again. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing that Palmyra does is it helps us understand how a healthy system responds to climate change. So here in Hawaii last year, our, our waters were much warmer than, than they had been in the past, and we had coral bleaching. We want to make sure that we are able to help our reefs be more resilient as that continues. I think that's a beautiful place to leave mm -hmm. things today. Thank you so much, Sam and Evelyn from the Museum. You're welcome. It's great Thank to you. be you. You're welcome. PBS for joining us. Here. We'll see you this Thursday at the Proto Hub, 6 to 8 p.m. on the movie Oceans from the series Earth, A New Wild, and also a panel discussion with the community about what we can do with the health of our oceans. Mahalo for joining us. We'll see you next week. Bye.